we're back. Back in the groove, back to the grind. But not everything has to be so routine, because every day at McDonald's, you can save on delicious faves with $3 bundles, like a McDouble or hot and spicy McChicken with small fries. Add any size soft drink for a dollar, medium frozen beverage for $1.69, or medium Minute Maid slushy for $2. Feels good to be back, doesn't it? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Prices and participation may vary. Limited time only. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Minute Maid is a registered trademark of the Coca-Cola Company. This message is brought to you by Wonder Wellness Cannabis Gummies. Where is your journey to wellness taking you today? Wonder offers the convenience of effects forward low dose gummies to take you there. Relax, laugh, or focus. It's your choice. It's cannabis in control. Discover the wonder of cannabis and wellness. Visit us at wonderwellness.co. These products are intended for persons 21 plus in Illinois. Individual experiences may vary. This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 61, Munchausen Syndrome by Proxy, Part 4. In the first three episodes in my series on Munchausen Syndrome by Proxy, I searched for answers about this commonly misunderstood form of child abuse, while I discussed multiple cases of children harmed or even killed by mothers who sought attention for themselves and thrived on drama, heedless of the damage they did to their children. During my search, I came out with more questions than answers. For this episode, I welcomed two very special guests to help me answer those questions. Author Andrea Dunlop drew from personal experience with a family member to write her latest novel, We Came Here to Forget, which centers around a woman whose family was torn apart by Munchausen by proxy. Dr. Mark Feldman, who I've quoted multiple times throughout the series, is an international expert in the field of factitious disorders whose credentials are too numerous to list in the show notes. I was honored to have an in-depth, fascinating conversation with both Andrea and Dr. Feldman, who provided their uniquely qualified perspectives and expertise on this baffling topic. This is part four in my series about the inexplicable phenomenon of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I truly appreciate all of you sticking with me through this difficult series. I've told a lot of horrific stories over the past 60 episodes, but entering the territory of Munchausen by proxy has been particularly gut-wrenching. The way these parents systematically and intentionally inflict medical torture on their children, often for years at a time, is unthinkably cruel, and most of us can't even wrap our minds around it. That's why I reached out to today's guests and asked for their expertise, and they absolutely delivered. Without further delay, please enjoy my incredibly informative conversation with Dr. Mark Feldman and Andrea Dunlop. Today on the podcast, I have two very special guests with me. I have Dr. Mark Feldman, the expert that I have been quoting in the last couple of episodes. And I also have Andrea Dunlop, the author of the recent novel, We Came Here to Forget, which I have also mentioned over the course of the past couple of episodes. So it's a pleasure to have you both on. Thank Thank you you for having us. Would you like to introduce yourselves and uh, just let me know a little bit about your backgrounds? My name is Mark Feldman. I am a clinical professor of psychiatry and an adjunct professor of psychology at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Um, I'll cut to the chase and say that I became interested in Munchausen by proxy approximately 30 years ago, 25 to 30 years ago, when I stumbled across it while researching another topic. And I just found the reading fascinating unbelievable, gripping, and um, decided to focus uh, my energies on adult Munchausen syndrome where people make themselves sick 
and Munchausen syndrome by proxy, where people make their children sick in most cases. Um, and as I said, I've never lost interest. I've been doing this for a long time and uh, haven't given up. I think there's there's a lot to learn, but there's a lot we can do when we come across these cases. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I'm Andrea Dunlop. I am a novelist, uh, primarily. Um, and I come to this issue via personal experience with my own family. And I based my most recent novel, which you uh, so kindly mentioned, We Came Here to Forget, which came out in the summer of 2019. Um, that was inspired by my family's experience. And Munchausen by Proxy was a big part of that novel. Uh, in the wake of that book's release, I was doing um, a fair amount of press uh, on that topic. And that was something that I really wanted to help raise awareness about if I could uh, via the book and via the press around that book. And it was during that period that I actually met Mark Feldman. And Mark, I don't know if we've gone a week since then without talking to each other. Um, yeah, we've we've become friends and he's gotten me involved with a wonderful committee of folks who are working on this, uh, working on this issue in all different kind of aspects. And so now I'm um, doing a couple of different things, uh, trying to raise awareness and build out some resources for families and professionals who are confronting this. So that's awesome. I think it really does need a lot more awareness raised just based on my last few weeks of research. Uh, it's, it's very in depth and there's so many nuances and, and just layers to this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's, kind of what I was hoping to break down a little bit through this series. And I think I ended up with more questions than I answered for myself. There's so much to it. And there's so many cases I really did not realize how prevalent this is. That's what's kept me engaged for so long. And when I first started studying it, there was really no research community or clinical community that had taken on Munchausen by proxy uh, as a project or an area of scrutiny. Um, but it's been um, much better in recent years. And Andrea mentioned the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. Uh, they've formed a Munchausen by proxy committee that is incredibly vital and brings together 25 or 30 of the nations and sometimes uh, even international experts in this subject. So uh, it's an exciting time for me and I feel much less lonely than I used to. Yes, as as do I. I think that the um, shared experience of people who are researching and working on this topic in a professional capacity and those of us that have encountered it in our personal lives is for at least a time you feel like you're the only person on earth who's ever been through it and i think that isolation can be really profound for adult survivors for family members for you know friends and professionals who've gotten pulled into these you know the blast zone for these cases is incredibly wide they're usually go on for a long time they pull lots of people in via various um, pieces of, of what's happening and so I, I think that just even being able to be in a room with other people who understand what you're talking about uh, is incredibly cathartic, I think, both on the professional and the personal side. And so that's something that that I'm hoping that we can all build on on the committee and, and with everything else that that we're we're all doing. Absolutely. It does sound like that's a shared sentiment is that everyone who has been through it or who has been affected by it had no idea that it was as widespread and felt like they were the only person it had ever happened to or who'd uh -huh. ever come across it. And I imagine that has a lot to do with the lack of reporting and, you know, people's hesitance to report, which I think we'll probably end up touching on later. I, I wanted to ask about that. Uh -huh. uh, but first, I'm just wondering, Dr. Feldman, is it possible at all? And I don't know if this is a possibility, especially in any type of time frame. Is it possible to make a distinction between Munchausen syndrome by proxy, factitious disorder imposed on another, and medical child abuse? You've asked one of the most compelling questions we're wrestling with right now, but uh, I can answer it this way. Munchausen syndrome by proxy or Munchausen by proxy is a form of abuse in which a mother feigns, exaggerates, or induces illness in her child in order to gain some kind of emotional satisfaction. Now, someone who does that has the mental disorder 
called factitious disorder imposed on another. In 2013, the American Psychiatric Association made factitious disorder imposed on another a formal mental disorder. Medical child abuse is an umbrella term for anyone who misuses healthcare settings and doctors to get hazardous or potentially hazardous and unnecessary medical intervention for their child. Okay, so Munchausen by proxy in itself is not a mental disorder, but it doesn't exist without the mental disorder of factitious disorder imposed on another. That's correct. Okay, and as far as FDIA, is that something that can mitigate someone's ability to be prosecuted, or how how would that work in a court of law? Well, efforts can certainly be made to use FDIA as a mitigating factor or kind of defense when a mother is shown to have engaged in Munchausen by proxy abuse. Uh, But I'm not really aware of too many cases in which that's been successful. But it was my concern all along when FDIA was added to DSM-5 that uh, we'd be seeing people who sought exoneration by saying they were the helpless victim of this mental illness that has led to sentences at times, pretty infrequently, that are less than I think are indicated. But um, there it hasn't been the wanton abuse of that mental disorder in court the way I expected. Yeah. And Lane, if I could just add something to that. Sure. Um, I think that that is really a struggle for people who are trying to figure out how to think about these offenders. Are they, you know, sick women who can't control their behavior or are they, you know, criminals? And obviously I don't think it has to be an either or situation, but something that's really been helpful to me in terms of a framing device of something that society has done a better job of wrapping its head around. Um, And this actually is something that Mike Weber talks about. He's a detective who's prosecuted a number of these cases. He's on the committee with Mark and I, um, is comparing it to pedophilia. You know, you, if the, if an offender, you know, commits sexual abuse against a child, obviously they are, you know, suffering from also a disorder, but you're not worried about their mental health as the chief issue, right? You're worried about what they've done to the child. So I think there is, like, it's good to make that separation between, you know, the 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 underlying disorder and thinking about the mental health of the offender, and then looking at the the crime and the the, the victim. And I think that that's, you know, just keeping the welfare of the child in the front of everyone's mind is is the best approach. Pedophilic disorder, as it's called in the Diagnostic Manual Psychiatrists use, is a formal mental illness. But nobody would say, oh, he's a victim of the mental illness called pedophilic disorder. We can't send him to jail and we can't have him register as a sex offender. But sometimes that sort of distorted thinking is used and applied to Munchausen by proxy or FDIA. um, And we just need much, much more education about what it is. Making the comparison with pedophilic disorder in court tends to be very compelling. People Mm -hmm. understand that right away. And so it's something I also bring up a lot. Yeah. And I think it's, it's sort of the right amount of shocking. I mean, I think that in some ways, what I've noticed is that when people are confronted with the details of one of these cases that they really have a strong desire to reach for any other reason that it could possibly be. I think there's just something that's so is still so deeply horrifying to people about a mother in particular doing these things that they're, you know, some of that I think is some of the, the desire to sort of, you know, lean into the, idea of this being a, a mother that just needs some support or a mother that just needs some help is 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 compelling for folks. Sure, I can imagine. Uh, I, I These are some of the worst cases that I've heard just because of the length of time that they go on. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, I've, I've heard of a lot of awful things while doing this. Um, but some of the some of the things that these children are subjected to is just unthinkable. The one thing I was thinking to compare it to, but yours is much better. But I, I thought, you know, if you, if you compare it to psychopathy, for example, uh, 
you know, these people who are psychopaths and kill someone, you certainly don't take that into account when mitigating the sentence. So obviously you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't take this into account either or so you'd think. Yeah, again, people try. Lawyers will always try to defend their clients. After all, they're advocates for their clients. And in court, they're not uh, sworn to tell the truth and only the truth, uh, unlike the witnesses. So um, I think you're making a really valid point there. Um, And I, I hope we continue on a path where we can explain this well enough to courts that we don't see tiny sentences for massive uh, abuse. For example, in the case of Garnet Spears, when the prosecution and defense did not at all bring MSP into it, or MSBP, depending on how you abbreviate it, they didn't bring that up during the trial at all, only for the judge to invoke it during sentencing. And not only that, but he also mentioned that Lacey suffered from it and gave her a lighter sentence, gave her mercy as a result. What was your thought on that? Uh, I was outraged uh, because you stated it exactly correctly. That's what happened. Um, The judge chose to bring up something that both the prosecution and defense felt had no place in the trial. She is still going to spend a very considerable amount of time in prison because I think her final sentence, if I'm not mistaken, was 15 years to life. Uh, We'll see how long it really ends up being. But uh, I share your concern that people view Munchausen by proxy as something a person suffers from rather than a form of abuse that uh, is bathed in deception and is a willful behavior Mm -hmm. that someone chooses to engage in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I think that's really, I mean, I I agree. I, I I was also very upset by that, especially because, you know, Lacey Spears, at least at the time of uh, the writing of John Glatt's book, um, which is excellent. I think you've, you mentioned it on the on the podcast before. Um, yes. But, you know, she's never had any accountability for what she's done. So I think that people can get very, you know, the, the level of the, the level of knowledge about Munchausen by proxy is so low across the board, you know, even with judges, with, you know, CPS, with all kinds of professionals who are charged with protecting children from it and prosecuting offenders. Um, you know, the, the level of knowledge is so low that I think it's really easy for people to get confused and to, you know, assume that this woman is delusional, that she wasn't in control of her thinking, that she wasn't in control of her actions. And I think it's really important for people to understand that it's not, a, it's not delusional disorder. People, you know, they, they, these offenders understand what they're doing. It's planned. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of sort of willful deception, as as Mark said. And so, I think kind of understanding the nature of their actions, which is what it should be based off of, and I think that's kind of where you get into some of those really tricky distinctions between, you know, when you're talking about Munchausen by proxy, that's a really sort of catch-all term, right? So it, that encompasses the actions and it encompasses the disorder. You know, people use it interchangeably to talk about both of those things. And medical child abuse, those are the actions and that's what should be, that's what the offenders should be, you know, prosecuted for. And I think it really, you know, bringing that that idea of them them being mentally ill in a way that makes them less legal, legally culpable is not appropriate because it doesn't meet any kind of legal definition of insanity. So I think, again, just that that knowledge piece is is so important. And when I testify in court, I always or or I'm advising attorneys, I always suggest they use the term medical child abuse, because unlike Munchausen by proxy, which isn't descriptive, you have no idea what it is when you hear Mm -hmm. Munchausen by proxy. Medical child abuse is infinitely clearer, very descriptive, and the courts understand it right away, whereas they sometimes simply can't wrap their heads around Munchausen and the history behind that term and what it means today. And that's what it seems is that for the most part, the knowledge that all of us have is from the media, you know, the layperson, what we know about Munchausen syndrome by proxy is what we've heard through the news, through the media, through any type of 
pop culture, the sixth sense and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Just the, the little things that drop here and there, but we most people don't dig into it further than that. So that's kind of what I was thinking when the judge was saying that during sentencing is, do you know what this actually is? Because I think if he had a better understanding at the time, as you explained, Dr. Feldman, and as you talked about in your most recent book also, Dying to be Ill, that's absolutely fascinating. I am still in the middle of it, but I can't put it down. In fact, I just put it down before I logged in here. But uh, it it really was very clear to me and uh, just throughout everything I've seen while I've been looking into these cases. It just seems so obvious that this is not something that they can't control. The level of untruthfulness in these people from a young age is just astonishing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's one of those things where once you know what you're looking at, you can't unsee it. But getting to that place, getting people to that place of understanding is difficult. And it pushes on a lot of really emotional hot buttons for people, too. And I think it really challenges these really deeply held cultural beliefs about motherhood. And I think that, you know, judges are human and they they have those those assumptions, too. Sure. Yeah. You can't. Uh, it's hard to fault someone for not knowing because you don't know what you don't know. But that's well, I kind point. of fault judges for not knowing. To be honest. I, mean, I kind of think if you're a judge and you're you're working on one of these cases, you might you might give it a you might give it a spin and, and try and find some good information about it. But but that yeah. information does need to be accessible. And, and we are we are working on that. So true. OK, yeah, that that's that's exactly right. Is is getting the awareness out there is most important, I think. In cases like that one, for example, or, or a lot of others I've been reading about lately, it's just it would be so important for if you're going to mention Munchausen syndrome by proxy, for example, that you know exactly what it entails. There's there's a lot to it. Like you've said, like we've all said during this conversation, it's just very nuanced. Uh, I was really interested in the connection you made, Dr. Feldman, in the book between the lack of empathy and Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I know lack of empathy is a hallmark of certain cluster B personality disorders and uh, the, that MSP is often comorbid with personality disorders and mental disorders of other types. But is it ever not comorbid or does it ever exist on its own without any other mental disorder? Well, again, these days we would call it factitious disorder imposed on another. We would say that's the mental disorder piece of it. But mm -hmm. I think you're on to something in that the vast majority of the perpetrators do have concurrent mental disorders like personality disorders, borderline, narcissistic, histrionic, antisocial, sometimes others like dependent. Um, they ha That just means that they have long-term unhealthy ways of trying to get their needs met. Um, and certainly Munchausen by proxy or medical child abuse is an unhealthy way, literally and figuratively, of getting one's needs met. They haven't learned to use some assertiveness, to use words uh, to get needs met. Instead, they objectify their children. They treat them as objects to be, be manipulated rather than children to be loved. And that speaks again to the depth of the personality disorders we almost always do see. That's kind of what I was thinking. It doesn't seem like it's something that just comes out of nowhere. It uh, it certainly does seem to have the comorbidity factor. It must be very, very high. I guess that's what brings me to the question, in your opinion, either one of you, do these perpetrators know what they're doing is wrong or immoral, or do they actually feel justified in doing it? Andrea? You know, I I feel like, Mark, we've spent actually a lot of time talking about this. Um, you know, I that was something I wondered about, I think, for for a long time. And Mark, you told me that I think you were the person that told me that they do understand what they're doing and they yes. do know the difference. And I think the reason it's so hard to distinguish that if you're a person who has a personal relationship with the uh, perpetrator is that when you are talking to someone who has this disorder, they 
frequently, not always. I've actually come to learn that not every perpetrator is a master manipulator, um, but certainly that is sort of the, the, I think that can be a bit of a, a, a hallmark. Um, but, you know, they are it's so convincing. And, you know, especially people that pull off the really, you know, elaborate years long sort of, for lack of a better word, long cons having to do with their kids' health and their convincing doctors and people who are fundraising and friends and family and strangers on the internet. Um, you know, they're incredibly convincing and it's, it feels as though they believe what they are saying to you. So it is very hard to emotionally know if that person has just lost track of the truth. Um, and I think it is actually much harder to accept that, in fact, they have not and that they know know what they're doing and that they know that they're lying, um, because then you have to sort of think of them in this colder light, I think, of looking up these symptoms and coming up with, you know, the way that they're going to explain it to the doctors and then, you know, telling the doctor one thing and telling you know, their friends and family, another thing, and, you know, sort of keeping at this whole thing up willfully, I think that's a much harder thing to accept that a person has done that. And that feels like a bigger betrayal. Um, I think most of us who've been through this would rather believe that the person is losing track of the truth for, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling answer, but I think it speaks to the sort of, (laughs) you get in a bit of a, um, you get in a bit of a distortion field uh, when you're talking to that person. And I, um, as to the person in my life, I haven't spoken to her in, in 10 years. And I think if I, if I spoke to her tomorrow, I, I would have a, a hard time anchoring myself in, in what I know to be true, or at least I fear that. I think it is very, very hard to be confronted with that person and, and understand, be able to hold on to the truth yourself. There are patients, and I use this term of, uh, I should say perpetrators, I use this term many, many years ago, who seem to be quasi-delusional. That is, they repeat, if you repeat a lie enough times, you may start to believe it. But I think that's um, a small minority of these perpetrators. So they just fake it till they make it, basically, and well, get and- to that point. Mark, I wonder if you can speak to this at all. You know, when I was talking to um, a colleague of ours on the committee, Dr. Mary Saunders, um, she told me that perpetrators that she's worked with have described it to her as this really intense, like their experience of committing this, um, have described it to her as a very intense compartmentalization. So they sort of, wall it off in their mind. And so then they almost forget it the way that you would forget where you put your keys. So you sort of in the moment, you know, have to remind yourself that, oh yeah, this is not true. (laughs) So that actually helped me understand it a little bit better because I wonder if there is this thing that happens where, you know, in the moment when it seems so convincing, kind of what you were just talking about, Mark, they are sort of half convinced themselves or they've just compartmentalized their behavior so completely that they're able to sort of distance themselves from it a little bit. That's certainly how it feels when you're on the other side of that conversation. So the manipulation just seems very similar to, you know, the gaslighting that might be seen in narcissistic abuse or mm-hmm. anything like that is people with that I hate to say talent, but that ability can really turn your brain inside out. So no one yeah. knows. <laughs> they don't, you don't know what's up and what's down. And I, I can imagine it would be very hard to find your way out of that. And it's very hard for doctors. People assume doctors, especially psychiatrists, would have immediate insight into someone's deception, uh, especially when it involves medical matters. But the reality is uh, that doctors miss the diagnosis all the time. And I think it's partly because of a lack of education. When I went through my medical school and residency educations and then joined the faculty of uh, academic psychiatry uh, department, I hadn't heard of Munchausen syndrome, let alone Munchausen by proxy. These were brand new terms to me. No one ever mentioned them during my training. I hope the situation has gotten better these days. Uh, We're working 
to make it better, but we don't have any objective evidence yet that it is that much better. Sure, that must be very hard to measure, I can imagine. Yeah. I've been in a love-hate relationship with my hair for the past year. I have really long, really thick hair, but I haven't had a trim since before quarantine started, so it was starting to feel like I had straw growing out of my head. I tried a couple of the more expensive drugstore shampoos and conditioners, but they didn't help much. Then I found out about Gemist, and I swear it's changed my life, or at least my hair, for the better. Gemist is a company that makes salon-quality hair care products backed by science. I took the two-minute quiz on their website, and they matched me with the perfect shampoo and conditioner for my hair type and texture based on the answers I gave them. I'm not kidding, the difference in my hair is for real. It's seriously so soft and touchable, and I can even run my fingers through it, even right after I get out of the shower, which I've never been able to do before. This stuff is magic. Did I mention that Gemist smells amazing? There are hints of mixed berries, pink pepper, lily of the valley, rose, crushed tonka bean, amber, and even a splash of orange. My son keeps burying his face in my hair because it smells so good. Also, and this is really cool, Gemist products use quality ingredients and are sulfate-free, paraben-free, dye-free, manufactured in the U.S., and never tested on animals. You can even try Gemist risk-free with free and easy returns within 30 days. If you're ready to have the best hair of your life, you have to try Gemist. Right now, my listeners can give Gemist a try and get 20% off their shampoo and conditioner smart subscription. Smart subscribers already save 20% on each order, so this is an amazing deal. And with free two-day shipping, you could have it by this weekend. Just visit Gemist.com to get your personalized recommendation and enter the code CHILDREN at checkout for 20% and free two-day shipping. That's Gemist.com, G-E-M-M-I-S-T dot com, and enter my code CHILDREN at checkout to get the best hair of your life. With all the video conferencing and virtual meetings going on these days, we all want to look our best. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the different methods of teeth whitening on the market. Now that I'm partnering with Smile Brilliant, I've learned a few things that you might find helpful about home teeth whitening methods. For example, LED lights are a novelty item. Whitening strips neglect the gum lines, crevices, and molars. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down your enamel. And whitening toothpaste only works on surface stains. So if none of these miracle products really works, what does? The number one product recommended by dentists is the custom-fitted tray, which usually costs an arm and a leg because they require a dentist to make them by hand using a model of your teeth. With Smile Brilliant's Lab Direct process, you can get custom-fitted teeth whitening trays at a fraction of the price without a single visit to the dentist. Using an exact model of your teeth, Smile Brilliant's lab technicians will handcraft your trays to give you the best possible whitening results. All you have to do is visit smilebrilliant.com, and when you order their system, make sure you use the coupon code CHILDREN at checkout for 30% off. When you receive the package from Smile Brilliant, it's really simple. You just make your dental impressions at home and return them using the prepaid envelope they provide you. In a matter of one week, Smile Brilliant will have your trays back in the mail. Using my coupon code, CHILDREN, means you're supporting me while saving a huge amount of money. So check out smilebrilliant.com today. And we're back, back in the groove, back to the grind. But not everything has to be so routine, because every day at McDonald's, you can save on delicious faves with $3 bundles, like a McDouble or hot and spicy McChicken with small fries. Add any size soft drink for a dollar, medium frozen beverage for $1.69, or medium Minute Maid slushy for $2. Feels good to be back, doesn't it? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Prices and participation may vary. Limited time only. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Minute Maid is a registered trademark of the Coca-Cola Company. Streaming only on Peacock. Ghislaine Maxwell had it all until she met Jeffrey Epstein. Ghislaine Maxwell's charged with enticement of minors, sex trafficking of children, and perjury. Epstein Shadow, Ghislaine Maxwell. Streaming now, only on Peacock. How many times have you uh, been consulted or asked to testify as an expert at trial? Probably about 200 times. Yeah, Lynn, I think it probably is would be shocking to some of your listeners to know how small the pool is of people of actual experts um i think you know mark's website was the only resource i could find when i was originally looking for um resources 10 years ago when i first this term first came on my radar and mm-hmm. um 
that's still pretty much the case. <laughs> Merck's website is the only resource out there that's not just sort of purely descriptive, like, you know, an entry on the Cleveland Clinic or what have you. Right. Um, so they're just, they're, they're really aren't that many people that have taken up this cause. And there's good reasons for that. I mean, Mark could probably tell you some things about some of the backlash that that's, that's come for people that, that have, have sort of taken up this cause. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's just not um, the, the, the level of the level of general knowledge and and what's out there. It's just not a lot. Yeah. I I was actually going to ask you about that, Dr. Feldman, the, um, I only found out about the organization yesterday, MAM, on Mothers Against Munchausen. I can only imagine how much damage they've done to your efforts. They have done particular damage in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> they they have a website that has not changed in more than 10 years. So it's not <laughs> being updated, but it's still no. online for the interested uh, listener. Not that I advise you to read the disinformation there. Um, right. But in the United Kingdom, there was targeting of specific Munchausen by proxy experts such that their licenses were temporarily revoked in both cases uh, based upon false information. They received their licenses back, but both quit the business um, because of what they had been put through. We're starting to see some of that uh, escalate in the United States. There are a few crusading reporters who uh, like to assume that because a mother says she didn't do it, that she didn't do it. All the evidence notwithstanding. And uh, they've been able to find media outlets that are more than willing to cover, again, their disinformation. And uh, it's Uh, As in the United Kingdom, it's ruining some careers and making people think that Munchausen by proxy is wildly overstated and nothing could be further from the truth. Right. I'd say, if anything, it's probably understated. But when I came across that website, which looks like it was built on angel fire in 2001, (laughs) (laughs) I was shocked and I started looking into the the doctors that you were talking about. I can't remember the gentleman's name, but yes, I saw that his license was revoked and just for spreading truthful information. That's the kind of backlash you get. It's, it's awful. And I just, uh, I, I really hope that it doesn't take hold just because some journalists feel that, you know, they, they have a great story. Let's run with it. But you're right when you say that some people just don't want to accept that a mother could do these things, but I'm here to tell you, they can do many, many terrible things. It's, yeah. uh, it's shocking, you know, what I some people some are of, capable some of. The journalists who have been most visible are pretty narcissistic themselves. Um, Mm -hmm. They enjoy the attention they get for covering Munchausen by proxy as if it were uh, an inherently faulty diagnosis. Um, They brag about the number of probably guilty mothers who approach them. And then they write about them as if those are all valid cases of misdiagnosis uh, and brag about it on Twitter and other social media. So uh, there are a lot of angles to this kind of backlash that we're seeing. Yeah, and I think people need to understand if they're reading about these cases is that number one, um, our systems from CPS to family court to criminal court to the police, uh, you know, on down the line are not equipped to handle this kind of abuse. These cases are unbelievably onerous. They involve, you know, uh, many times tens of thousands of pages of medical records. I mean, they just are there's a very, very high bar to actually get, uh, you know, successfully, you know, get a get a conviction in one of these cases, even when the abuse is really severe. So I think it's really important for people to understand that and also to understand that <laughs> when it comes to the intersection of this issue and the media, the entire you know emotional psychological reward for people that do have FDIA is attention and sympathy. And so what could be better than media coverage about how you are a victim of something oh, <laughs> and how right. you are a heroic mother? I mean, that is sort of that is basically the biggest possible payoff you could get, right, is to get, you know, on the on camera, get in get in the media. Um, 
And so you're really, you know, r- reporters who are not careful, um, even if the reporters are, you know, well-meaning, obviously not all reporters are. Some are, are more concerned with having, you know, sensational headlines, et cetera. But even if a reporter is very well-meaning, um, you know, they can get pulled into essentially the the scam of it all. Um, because a lot of times these, these perpetrators are extremely convincing and they don't look or sound crazy. I mean, I think one of the biggest issues I have with the way that it's been portrayed in sort of popular culture. I'm thinking of, um, I'm thinking of some, you know, the act on Hulu, which was, it was great on some level because I think it brought the sort of general awareness of Munchausen by proxy being a thing that exists, you know, to the fore a little bit more in people's minds. But I think some people may have walked away from that show thinking that, oh, you know, these perpetrators are extremely obvious. They seem really nutty from the outside. I'd be able to like tell this person from, you know, across the street. And that's just not the case. I mean, a lot of times the perpetrators seem like really caring, you know, high functioning, loving mothers. And so I think that, you know, media people can also get fooled. And so I think people really need to be aware of what the uh, that payoff is, because people who have this are also going to pursue media coverage um, for that exact reason. So I think putting out a beacon to sort of like, is this you? Tell us your story. Um, is a very bad idea for obvious reasons. Many of the perpetrators <clears throat> attempt to get off by contacting government officials as well, up in, and including the president. Uh, but they routinely contact their congressmen who, knowing nothing about the subject, but wanting to get a vote, advocates for uh, his voter and says she's being maligned and mistreated and just repeats everything she has said. And I've seen this happen time after time where cases are dismissed because of government official interference. Wow, that's the last place they should be putting their attention, I would imagine, right. especially without knowing the first thing about it. Exactly. I was going to ask how often, in your opinion, false convictions might actually occur on the basis of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. It sounds like it's a lot fewer than some want us to believe. I did some research and I'm dating myself again, but back in 1999 with a co-author named Deirdre Rand uh, into false accusations or misdiagnoses of Munchausen by proxy. Uh, They were well-meaning, but we wanted to study the ones that just happened to be wrong. And we found almost none. Uh, The rate of false diagnoses was about 2% of all claims. And uh, that's within the error margin we would expect for just about any diagnosis. It may be lower, in fact, than a lot of psychiatric diagnoses. So false diagnoses can occur. Um, And in Dying to Be Ill, I have a table which lists the situations in which there's a heightened risk of misdiagnosed Munchausen by proxy. But um, I think the bigger problems you sort of suggested is under recognition by far uh, and failing to make a diagnosis, even when the evidence is overwhelming. Again, because people don't know anything about it or they're, they don't want to get involved or they fear a lawsuit um, or they're overpowered by the media or overpowered by the perpetrator's attorney. You know, and I think something that I've found is that Sometimes I think parents have an understandable and sort of like visceral reaction to the the idea of this kind of abuse if they're unfamiliar with it and and have this, you know, I think it's a horrible fear for for any parent to be falsely accused of abusing their children. Um, I think any, you know, I have a, I have a two and a half year old and certainly any of my friends that have had to take their kids to the ER, which is like frequently when you have little kids, um, you know, for anything is, I think that's, you know, they, they ask you all these questions. And I think that, that sometimes parents hear about this and they, they, they think, well, gosh, what if my child got really sick and I had to take them to the doctor all the time and someone accused me of doing this. Um, and as Mark said, you know, it's, it's not, and even Mark, you were talking about sort of false diagnoses. I think, you know, let alone that something, someone would actually get, you know, arrested for this or tried for it or convicted for it, which is like a whole other standard. Um, I, I think it's 
probably vanishingly rare. Um, and also, I would want to point out that the best way to present prevent false accusations um, is to have robust systems that understand what this abuse looks like. Um, and then we will also know what it is not. So we will be able to then look at, you know, a, a parent of a medically fragile child who is not, you know, exaggerating or inducing anything about that child's illness and that child's illness is genuine and the parents just trying to get to the bottom of it. And if we understand what this abuse looks like, we'll understand when it is not that. Um, so I think that, you know, knowledge is, is power on all sides here. The over anxious or just anxious parent is reassured by negative results uh, for their child, normal findings. The much as my proxy mother is often upset when the doctor sure. says there's nothing wrong and gets agitated and demands more tests, accuse them of n- accusing them of not caring about her child. So that can tell you a lot just in that one piece of behavior. Yeah, absolutely. Andrea, I was going to ask you uh, on that same note about taking your child to the ER and, and, and that sort of thing. After going through an experience like you did with your family member, how do you handle these medical situations or even questions that come up with your own child, who is adorable, by the way, on your Instagram? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I knock on wood. I feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna just curse myself by saying this. We have not had to take Fiona to the ER yet, oh, which is sort goodness. of incredible because boy, does that child like to climb on things and jump off <laughs> things and generally run around like animal from the Muppets. But. Um, but no, I mean, we we have not have not had to take her to the ER yet. But I think, you know, that has not been worrisome for me, I think, because I actually probably know I am not the parent that would have that fear because I know that doctors want to believe parents. I mean, that's the thing is like pediatricians are trained to believe parents, they wouldn't be able to do their jobs if they were questioning everything a parent told them, right? I mean, that's just it. That's the, that's the entire sort of modality. Um, so, you know, all, all of my experiences with, um, you know, with with Fiona's pediatrician have, have been really positive. I think what was harder for me, um, candidly, you know, during my pregnancy and when I was a brand new mom, you know, I think it, it, that that brought brought back some bad memories. Um, my younger nephew was only in my life when he was really little, um, and so really my my only previous experience um, with uh, you know being around really like really little really little babies was was with him. So I think that that there were some things about that that were that were difficult, um, and just it brought back it brought up some fears. But actually, I think that for me, um, becoming a mom has become, has been a a really healing experience. And it's been, um, really nice to have my parents get to be grandparents, um, because they were unfortunately robbed of that experience. Um, so I, I think, I think actually most of it has been, has been really wonderful. But yeah, I think I'm probably the last parent who's worried about a false accusation of <laughs> medical <laughs> child abuse because I think it doesn't, I mean, I don't, again, I think it's just vanishingly rare. Everything that I have since learned would tell me that that's not something that I need to be worried about. Well, that's good. At least there's that sort of a uh, silver lining there. How much of your experience did you use as inspiration for the novel? I think that something that I've since learned, you know, again, kind of going back to this idea that when you are the person going through it, you feel like you're the only family on the face of the earth who's ever gone through this. And something that the book taught me and having the book out in the world and being able to do some media and meet Mark and the other members of the committee, um, I have obviously since learned that I'm not the only person in the world. And I think that I've learned that there are a lot of things about that experience that are sort of really similar to other people who've been through it. And that there are sort of these hallmarks of what, what folks go through in terms of their process of healing and trying to, you know, grapple with, with what happened. Um, And, you know, I, one of the most profound experiences probably of my life, but also of, of definitely of being an author as I was doing a 
book club here locally. And it was just, you know, it was like a mom friends book club. It wasn't anything having to do with, you know, anything much hasn't by proxy related. Um, and I was speaking to this book club and I was, you know, mentioning that, that this was something I had personal experience with. And, and the woman sitting next to me burst into tears and told me she was a survivor of Munchausen by proxy. And we just gave each other a big hug. And that was the first time I'd ever met another person in real life who, who had, you know, had experience with it. And so that just leads me to believe that again, it's, it's more common. Um, if it were as, if it were so vanishingly rare, it seems unlikely that I would have now met a couple of times. I've had a couple more experiences like that and kind of come across people. And so, um, you know, I think that the book has ended up being being a really cathartic experience, and I'm I'm very glad that it's you know led me down the path that I'm that I'm on now um, in terms of hoping to help raise awareness for it. I just got chills when you said that mm. <laughs> meeting someone else in the wild like that. It just goes yeah, it was amazing. it was it was unexpected, and I, I sort of. Um, you know, I had, I really had my whole spiel down about explaining what it, what it is and kind of, you know, because I, I did get a lot of questions. It is such a um, sort of explosive topic. And it was really, you know, the summer of 2019 was when the act came out and it was when Sharp Objects was on. And so there was a lot of, you know, big pop culture products that that had to do with my chosen by proxy. And so people really had a lot of questions for me about, about it. And so I had sort of, you know, prepared myself to answer these questions about it. And then to have this really emotional moment with someone and just really human moment, um, you know, it was just really, was really beautiful. And actually, interestingly, in that, um, there's just a, there's a lot of tears at that book club meeting. Let me tell you, there was another woman um, who had had a medically fragile child and had had a child who had a whole bunch of health issues her first year of life. And, you know, the child was older by then and and was doing fine, but she was so upset with the idea that someone would co-opt what had been her actual experience and present themselves as being in that position. Because she said, you know, when I was going through this, uh, you know, having a, a child in this precarious health situation when they're really little and, you know, how little babies are just, they're so fragile. It's, it's, it's heart, heart wrenching when they have medical problems. Um, obviously it's the, sort of the whole, the whole point of this, but, um, you know, I, I think she was just, she was so deeply upset at thinking about someone pretending they were in that situation or causing that situation when she had just spent her whole, you know, first year, few years of motherhood, just wishing for nothing but having a healthy child. Um, So, you know, it's really, it's a really emotional issue for people. And I think that that's, that's where, that's where I hope to be helpful is to sort of meet people on that emotional level and help them understand that way. Yeah. To humanize it. And uh, Mm -hmm, exactly. I don't see any other more appropriate way really to bring it to the forefront of the conversation because a lot of times when it comes to crime stories and things like that, people look at it as, oh, this is entertainment. This is something Mm -hmm. outside of reality. But when you meet someone face to face who's lived through it, it's, it's a very different. Yeah. And I think that, you know, something that tends to happen in the coverage of these cases is obviously there are so many sensational details with these cases. I mean, obviously, like Gypsy, Gypsy is the sort of ultimate with the online boyfriend and the murder and that whole thing. But any of these cases, they, there are a lot of extremely shocking details. And there are these sort of, um, you know, there's these combination of things that people find really fascinating from a sort of true crime junkie perspective. You know, you've got female perpetrators, you've got an underlying sort of exotic seeming medical, dis- or, you know, um, mental disorder. And then you've got this gigantic con that, you know, pulls in all these people. And sometimes they've got, you you know, these hoaxes that sort of go on for years or decades. Um, so I think people do get very fixated on all of those details, understandably. Um, and so what I hope that we can see more of is stories that really, again, like humanize everyone involved, because I, I think that the stories of, you know, the non-offending spouse, so usually obviously 
a dad in, in these cases, um, the, the, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the friends, the church members, the, all, the doctors who are treating the children. And of course, it's very traumatic for them when they find out they've been used as a tool for abuse, obviously. But it's like the wide sort of swath of destruction and how that affects people's lives. Um, I think that only by understanding that can we really understand the damage these cases can do to entire communities. Um, I mean, that really the blast zone is is usually very large and they usually go on for a long time, even for the ones that where there is eventually a conviction. Um, so I think, you know, the more we can sort of humanize it and get people to understand that. And I think, you know, something I've come a long way on personally, um, you know, it, it takes some time as it sounds like, Lane, you're sort of going through this yourself, having having done, uh, um, you know, some real deep diving on the topic. But I think it takes it takes some time to really metabolize all of this. And I've really come to a place where I I don't think that it's helpful to sort of present perpetrators as monsters. I think that we can see the humanity in all of it and try and understand why it happens and try and think about how we can, you know, help people before it gets to this point, how we can, you know, intervene sooner, how we can protect children and also how we can, I mean, I don't think that we have to, I don't think it has to be an either or, you know, I, I agree with everything Mark said, and I think it's really important that we don't get distracted by the idea of it being a mental health issue. But I also am not of the mind that people should never try and treat perpetrators if they're willing to be accountable and if they want help. Um, and also kind of recognizing some of those signs really earlier on, even before people have children, obviously there's a lot of behavior that usually predates these. And, you know, we are talking about some of those uh, comorbidities. Um, but I think, you know, awareness on that level, I think is really helpful too. I don't think we have to just say, you know, anybody who does this is a monster and, and that's, that's the end of the story. My 16-year-old came into my room yesterday and started telling me about the the fight he's having on Twitter with someone of, <laughs> about how the 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 big serial killers and whatnot they're still just people. Every one of these perpetrators is still just a person. You can't mm-hmm. put that predator or monster label on them because then it it detaches you from it. And I think mm-hmm. that's the most important thing. And and that's what I really try to do with this show in particular is put the focus on the victim and and the humanity and and empathy. It's that is the most important thing Mm -hmm. uh, that I think we all need to focus on. But I think you're probably right. Early intervention would be ideal if especially if the person who is going down that path is willing to be treated or or Mm -hmm. recognizes that they could turn their behavior around. Yeah. And Mark can speak to this better than I can, but I mean, that, that, that does happen. And I think it's sort of, it's balancing, it's balancing the understanding that that's not going to be the case every time. And that someone does really have to have accountability with also like leaving, I think the possibility for, for that. I agree with absolutely everything that's been said. Um, I do think that uh, doctors misunderstand and I'm, I'm shifting gears here, but they misunderstand the laws that exist in all 50 states that govern their reporting suspected child abuse. Uh, they just need a reasonable suspicion and uh, to make the report in good faith. And they're immune from lawsuits and things of that sort for contacting Child Protective Services. But there's something about Munchausen by proxy where doctors just don't want to believe it. They may or may not document it in the chart, but they feel like they've got to have a smoking gun of some sort to call Child Protective Services. And we see this in case after case where maybe one doctor or two or three have wondered about Munchausen by proxy, but ignored their statutory responsibility to call Child Protective Services and or the police. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the reason these cases can go on. The abuse can go on for such a long time. I did see that in a a couple of the cases I went through just yesterday that it said it was documented in the, in the chart, but they never Uh contacted anyone. And what a shame, honestly, it may have helped. It may not have, but at the very least the effort would have been there. We're talking about a mortality rate among published reports among these children of uh, six to 9%. 
which makes it an especially lethal form of child abuse. And to be um, kind of blithe about it makes no sense at all and even verges on the inhumane. That's assuming the person even knows enough about Munchausen by proxy to be able to document it in the chart. I think what you're both doing is very important for that reason. Is more people, more doctors, more people on the street. Everyone needs more information in order to be able to prevent anything like this from happening. And I think that goes for all forms of child abuse, uh, just knowing the signs. But in particular with this type of child abuse, what signs can the layperson look for in, say, their neighbor or their, their sister or anyone they know What can we look for? Well, I think one thing is if there are persistent or recurrent illnesses for which a cause is is, can't be found and treatment is never effective. For example, antibiotics work against the infections that are shown to be sensitive to them. If you see very repeated antibiotic failures, uh, you even as a neighbor should have some suspicions. I'd also worry if other children in the family have had had unexplained illnesses or even died for reasons that are unclear. Um, If there are an extraordinary number of doctor visits without a clear reason, I'd be suspect. Um, Some of these perpetrators engage in a lot of pathological lying. They lie gratuitously at times. It doesn't serve any purpose other than maybe a little self-aggrandizement. Um, and it often backfires because the lies aren't told that well. But if you know that your neighbor has a tendency to tell tall tales, especially about her children and her personal history, I would wonder again about it. And finally, if the mother uh, has a history of making herself sick, engaging in factitious disorder behaviors. Uh, She's at heightened risk of engaging in Munchausen by proxy. Each is a risk factor for the other. And uh, not every neighbor is going to be able to answer all those questions, but they should at least have resources that they can access to uh, explore it further or proceed with making a report to Child Protective Services or the police understanding that they will be the detectives. They will do the investigation. It's not up to the next door neighbor to do that. I think that's important too, is is you don't have to worry about getting yourself too involved because people need to know they can make reports like this anonymously. Yeah. Yeah. And also something that, um, you know, if especially if you are, if you do happen to be closer with the person that you suspect of, of, of perpetrating, um, not to confront them right away. Um, perpetrators tend to <laughs> react badly to that and, and, and will often cut off contact. So I, I everything that I've kind of read and, and, you know, worked on with, again, Detective Mike Weber um, has, has suggested that, you, you know, keeping keeping a sort of lower profile and keeping in contact with that person if possible, just because you could be a really useful resource if there is an investigation. Um, and on that note, before I forget to mention it, um, I did want to tell you actually about a project that Mark and I have been working on um, for many months to put together. So um, we've been talking a lot about the lack of resources uh, throughout this call. And so we've been, you know, working to try and remedy that. We're putting together um, a site called Munchausen Support and it will actually be up in hopefully the next month. Um, and it's basically a collection of resources for family members, survivors, and frontline professionals. So we've been, um, you know, just really going through all of the best practices that the committee folks from APSAC have put together, um, you know, best practices for police, for educators, for CPS, um, for guardian ad litems, um, also for, you know, again, yeah, if you're, if you're just a person who's, who's worried about, you know, your friend or neighbor or, or auntie or sister or whomever, um, and, and kind of going through all those resources and, and linking them up and, and, and giving kind of some, some best practices. So it's, it's a project that I'm hoping will, you know, expand to encompass other things, but, but we're trying to get that initial website up in the next few weeks. So exactly for this reason to make that, that information just a a lot more accessible and easier to find. That is fantastic. And as soon as you get it up, I'll add it to my resources page on my blog and I'll put it out on social media for you. Just, uh, you know, 
spreading awareness wherever we can. <laughs> it's important. That sounds great. Well, thank you both for everything that you do, you know, to make this more well known and to, to help people understand it better than I think the media has, has uh, kind of given us this knowledge that's not necessarily accurate. So it's very much appreciated. And uh, I'm sure that your work has helped save children already. Yes, I think it has. And that's very gratifying as I look back at a long career. Um, thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I mean, I know you're both very busy people, so I do really appreciate it. And I'm I'm very, very honored to have this opportunity. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you, Lane. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. I'll definitely post the link to Andrea and Dr. Feldman's new website on my social media platforms when it's up and running. So be sure to follow me on Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod. I hope this series has been informative, and I hope you've enjoyed it and learned from it. I know I have. As dark as this subject matter has been, it's also incredibly fascinating digging into the hows and whys of factitious disorders and the havoc they can wreak on people's lives, especially children caught up in a parent's web of lies. If you know of a child who may be the victim of medical child abuse, it's probably best not to confront the parent, but please don't hesitate to make a report to your local child protection agency. You could be saving a child's life. That's it for this week. Join me next week for a new case. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to suffer the little children pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone. And we're back, back in the groove, back to the grind. But not everything has to be so routine, because every day at McDonald's, you can save on delicious faves with $3 bundles, like a McDouble or hot and spicy McChicken with small fries. Add any size soft drink for a dollar, medium frozen beverage for $1.69, or medium Minute Maid slushy for $2. Feels good to be back, doesn't it? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Prices and participation may vary. Limited time only. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Minute Maid is a registered trademark of the Coca-Cola Company. This message is brought to you by Wonder Wellness Cannabis Gummies. Where is your journey to wellness taking you today? Wonder offers the convenience of effects forward low dose gummies to take you there. Relax, laugh, or focus. It's your choice. It's cannabis in control. Discover the wonder of cannabis and wellness. Visit us at wonderwellness.co. These products are intended for persons 21 plus in Illinois. Individual experiences may vary.